Well, hi everyone. The NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, released a video yesterday as part of their meeting to discuss the collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge. This bridge collapsed on January 28th, 2022. There were several vehicles on the bridge at the time it collapsed that resulted in 10 injuries, some of them very serious. Uh, you could see that car that's upside down on its roof. Apparently a 75 year old dentist was in that vehicle and he suffered a broken neck and a broken, broken sternum. So quite serious injuries. So in this video, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what the NTSB findings were, but more importantly, relate you know, systematically how such disasters happen and what it means for other aging bridge projects throughout the United States. This bridge was put in service in 1973, so it failed just under 50 years after its uh, opening. So the bridge is owned by the city of Pittsburgh. Oversight and inspection is the responsibility of Pennsylvania DOT, and maintenance was the responsibility of the city of Pittsburgh as the owner of the bridge. So we could see the bridge had a total length of 447 feet. The bridge girders, which support the bridge deck, are supported by four legs that transfer the load from the bridge girders down to the foundation. Here's a close-up of what one of those legs look like. Now, interestingly, in the NTSB video, they showed the actual footage, uh, camera footage from the bus that was traveling eastbound on the bridge at the time of the collapse. In fact, it's probably the weight of this uh, segmented bus, basically two buses in one, it appears to have initiated the collapse. And this bus was well within the weight ratings for this bridge at 27 tons. Now this video is absolutely terrifying. You can see they nearly made it across the bridge. Okay, so they're going eastbound, and if you look at the railing on the left, you'll start to see it drop as the bridge deck collapses. Now here's the front-facing view. The bridge is literally collapsing behind them as they're traveling. And uh, he was able to stop before he went over the, the big lip from the end of the bridge deck. I mean, this is real life. This uh, bridge collapsed at 6.30 in the morning. And fortunately, because of the snow that had occurred overnight, the local school district had delayed start of two hours. So there easily could have been kids in cars, kids on buses going to school crossing this bridge at the time of the collapse. I mean, it's really like a scene out of a Final Destination movie. It's just unbelievable. So the first thing that comes up is, well, when was this bridge inspected? And it turns out it was inspected annually since 2014. And the inspections noted numerous problems. They pointed out uh, clogged or basically silted up drains on the bridge deck. And this is particularly problematic when road salts are used like they are for this bridge in this region of the country in the winter. And you could see the type of corrosion that resulted. So the runoff water full of salt, instead of going down the drains, would go through nooks and crannies in the bridge deck and run down these support legs, these, these steel support legs. And it's important to note that these uh, steel supports were made of what they call weathering steel. So if you've seen transmission line poles that uh, looked like a kind of a fuzzy orange texture and color driving around, that's, that's what they call weathering steel. So the steel oxidizes but forms a thin but very strong protective layer preventing further corrosion. And for that to happen, there's there needs to be some uh, moisture and then it has to dry out but in the presence of salt this protective layer isn't formed and corrosion is just accelerated which is what happened here i mean you can see holes clear through the steel support so they dutifully documented these problems year after year after year and apparently nothing was done with it i mean look at this complete separation at this location. It's just complete corrosion. So you can see the, the main plate in the support leg. This green that you see is the foliage. Uh, you're seeing clear through this support member. Again, numerous holes in these stiffener legs for the legs. So as I mentioned, 
these problems were consistently documented over a period of 10 plus years. And apparently nothing was done aside from putting in some extra cables to stabilize these legs. And that was supposed to be a temporary measure. But repair of corroded areas, application of protective coatings, replacement of structural members that needed to be replacing, uh, cleaning out the drains in the bridge deck, apparently none of that happened. And so to me, this brings up a broader question. And I've touched on this in other videos, but I've, I've stated that people in general are poor at assessing risk accurately. And engineers are typically in the best position to assess risk relative to a building or bridge. Yet we consistently see engineers who are involved in these inspections, uh, they're, they're not raising the alarm about, hey, this thing needs to be closed. I, I wouldn't drive over it. I wouldn't want my family driving over it. You know, we've inspected this. You haven't done anything for years. You know, we don't want any part of this if you're not gonna uh, close the bridge. You don't see that type of discussion in these reports, apparently. And it reminds me of uh, the Surfside collapse of Champlain Towers condominium building in Florida. The structural engineer documented many problems with that building, some of which he uh, identified as structural deficiencies in the building. And uh, he mentioned that well into the report, I think on page seven of a nine page report. It wasn't in, in bold font at the very beginning of, hey, you need to fix this or get people out of the building. You know, you don't see this in these bridge inspection reports. You need to fix this and in the meantime, close the bridge. So again, I've shown this slide before, but risk assessment is a combination of probability and severity. So you could have a low probability for an event to occur, but if the severity is great enough, the risk is very high. Now, I ask you, if you see big holes in structural steel that's supporting uh, the bridge deck in a non-redundant fashion, and that is, if one fails, the whole bridge is gonna fail. In that scenario, how could anybody look at this and compartmentalize, apparently, their involvement? Like, well, my job is just to, to uh, do the inspection and, and write the report. You know, there are engineers involved in this process. Typically, there are engineers doing the field inspection, but there are certainly engineers back at the office and these are typically done by consultants on contract through the DOTs uh, to provide these inspection services. You know, if, if I was an engineer and I had an inspector bring these photos to the office, I'd say, holy cow, this, this thing's got to be closed. I mean, just as a thought experiment, imagine if you had these gaping holes in the support leg and, and that's how the, they were installed during the original construction. Of course, no owner would tolerate that. But yet when these same problems develop over a period of years, somehow it's okay just to live with it. You know, we see the same thing. I mentioned Champlain Towers. We saw the same thing with the bridge collapse at Florida International University, where several people were killed in that collapse. 94 people were killed in the Champlain Towers collapse. So again, here's an inspection photo from 2013 compared to 2021. You typically say, hey, this bridge should have been closed when these problems were documented during the inspection, but we're not gonna assess blame. You know, I think that's, I can understand politically why they're trying to avoid assessing blame. I guess they think the courts can do that or local authorities can do that or state authorities. But the problem with that approach is it overlooks the systematic problems that, are, that lead to these kind of disasters. You can't just say, hey, these bridge support legs corroded so much that once sufficient load was applied, the, the whole thing came down. But we're not gonna assess any kind of blame with that. <clears throat> well, was it a fail, failure of inspection? Well, no, the, the inspections documented what was going on. So it was a, a failure to act, certainly. And how does that happen? And then what are the implications for other bridges throughout the state of Pennsylvania and other parts of the country for that matter? I mean, we've seen this, these types of issues uh, where things weren't either documented or they were documented and nothing was done in the I-195 bridge fiasco that's going on in Rhode Island right now. So I think uh, the plaintiff's attorneys are going to have a, a cakewalk uh, in securing a pretty substantial settlement on behalf of their clients who were injured in this bridge collapse. 
I mean, I'm not offering a legal opinion here, but uh, the NTSB pretty well teed it up for them. And uh, there's been some indication that the city of Pittsburgh is avoiding release of detailed inspection reports at this time because of pending litigation, which I don't think is uh, appropriate as a, as a public entity. They should be releasing everything they have and, and people should be looking at the inspection reports for other bridges in their jurisdiction. So let me know what you think in the comments section. Why is it that we have these issues on project after project where people see a problem, you know, as the TSA says, if you see something, say something, uh, you know, there's a duty to inform, a, a duty to advise on be, on, for engineers on behalf of their clients and the public. The, the engineering licensure is uh, through individual states that regulate engineering practice. And uh, there are certainly ethical requirements for the practice of engineering. So if you're looking at a, a bridge that's in poor condition and you wouldn't drive over it or you wouldn't let a family member drive over it, you should let the public know that they shouldn't drive over it either. I want to send a shout out to the channel members. I thank you all very much for your support. It enables me to continue posting a video at least once a week. Also, I want to thank the uh, people who have provided super thanks. That's another way to support the channel as well as liking, subscribing, and commenting. Also, you can check out a downloadable link that I have in the description for the biggest civil engineering disasters in the past 100 years. Thanks very much, everyone.